Chapter 7 of A Cathedral Courtship by Kate Douglas Wiggin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Cathedral Courtship by Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 7 Durham. She. Durham, July something or other, at Farmer Hendry's. We left York this morning, and arrived in Durham about eleven o'clock. It seems there is some sort of an election going on in the town, and there is not a single fly at the station. Mr. Copley looked about in every direction, but neither horse nor vehicle was to be had for love or money. At last we started to walk to the village, Mr. Copley so laden with our hand luggage that he resembled a pack mule. We called first at the three tons where they still keep up the old custom of giving a wee glass of cherry brandy to each guest on his arrival. But, alas, they were crowded, and we were turned from the hospitable door. We then made a tour of the inns, but not a single room was to be had, not for that night, nor for two days ahead, on account of the same election. "'Hadn't we better go on to Edinburgh, Aunt Cecilia?' I asked as we were resting in the door of the jolly sailor. "'Edinburgh! Never!' she replied. "'Do you suppose that I could voluntarily spend a Sunday in those bare Presbyterian churches until the memory of these past ideal weeks has faded a little from my memory? What? Leave out Durham and spoil the set?' In her agitation and disappointment she spoke of the cathedrals as if they were souvenir spoons. "'I intended to stay here for a week or more.' and write up a record of our entire trip from Winchester while the impressions were fresh in my mind. And I had intended on doing the same thing, said Mr. Copley. That is, I hoped to finish off my previous sketches, which are in a frightful state of incompletion, and spend a good deal of time on the interior of this cathedral, which is unusually beautiful. At this juncture Aunt Cecilia disappeared for a moment to ask the barmaid if, in her opinion, the constant consumption of malt liquors prevents a more dangerous indulgence in brandy and whisky. She is gathering statistics, but as the barmaids can never collect their thoughts while they are drawing ale, Aunt Cecilia proceeds slowly. For my part, said I, with mock humility, I am a docile person, who never has any intentions of her own, but who yields herself sweetly to the intentions of other people in her immediate vicinity are you asked mr copley taking out his pencil yes i said so what are you doing merely taking note of your statement that's all now miss van tick of course aunt cecilia appeared at this delightful moment i have a plan to propose i was here last summer with a couple of harvard men and we lodged at a farmhouse about a mile distant from the cathedral if you will step into the coffee-room for an hour, I'll walk up to Farmer Hendry's and see if they will take us in. I think we might be fairly comfortable. Can Aunt Cecilia have Apollinaris and black coffee after her morning bath? I asked. I hope, Catherine, said Aunt Cecilia majestically, I hope that I can accommodate myself to circumstances. If Mr. Copley can secure apartments for us, I shall be more than grateful. So here we are, all lodging together in an ideal English farmhouse. There is a thatched roof on one of the old buildings, and the dairy house is covered with ivy, and Farmer Hendry's wife makes a real English curtsy, and there are herds of beautiful sleek Durham cattle, and the butter and cream and eggs and mutton are delicious, and I never, never want to go home any more. I want to live here forever and wave the American flag on Washington's birthday. I am so happy that I feel as if something were going to spoil it all. Twenty years old today, I wish Mama were alive to wish me many happy returns. The cathedral is very beautiful in itself, and its situation is beyond all words of mine to describe. I greatly admired the pulpit, which is supported by five pillars sunk into the backs of squashed lions. But Mr. Copley, when I asked him the period, said, Pure Brummagem. There is a nice old cell for refractory monks, 
that we agreed would be a lovely place for Mrs. Benedict if we can lose her in it. She arrives as soon as they can find room for her at the three tons. Memoranda. Casual remark for breakfast table, or perhaps luncheon. It is a trifle heavy for breakfast. Since the sixteenth century, despite the work of Inigo Jones and the great Wren, not Jenny Wren, Christopher, architecture has had, in England especially, no legitimate development. This is the only cathedral with a bishop's throne or a sanctuary knocker. He. Durham, July 19. O child of fortune, thy name is J. Q. Copley. How did it happen to be election time? Why did the inns chance to be full? How did Aunt Cecilia relax sufficiently to allow me to find her a lodging? Why did she fall in love with a lodging when found? I do not know. I only know fate smiles. That Kitty and I eat our morning bacon and eggs together. That I carve Kitty's cold beef and pour Kitty's sparkling ale at luncheon. I go to Maitens with Kitty, and dine with Kitty, and walk in the gloaming with Kitty, and Aunt Cecilia. And after a day of heaven like this, like Lorna Doone's lover, I, and like every other lover, I suppose, I go to sleep, and the roof above me swarms with angels, having Kitty under it. She was so beautiful on Sunday. She has been wearing her favorite browns and primroses through the week, but on Sunday she blossomed into blue and white, topped by a wonderful hat, whose brim was laden with hyacinths. She sat on the end of a seat in the nave, and there was a capped and gowned crowd of university students in the transept. I watched them and they watched her. She has the fullest, whitest eyelids, and the loveliest lashes. When she looks down I wish she might never look up, and when she looks up I am never ready for her to look down. If it had been a secular occasion, and she had dropped her handkerchief, seven-eighths of the students would have started to pick it up but I should have got there first. Well, all this is but a useless prelude, for there are facts to be considered. Delightful, warm, breathing facts. We were coming home from Evensong, Kitty and I. I am anticipating, for she was still Miss Schuyler then, but never mind. We were walking through the fields, while Mrs. Benedict and Aunt Cecilia were driving, as we came across a corner of a bit of meadowland that joins the stable and the garden, we heard a muffled roar, and as we looked around we saw a creature with tossing horns and waving tail making for us, head down, eyes flashing. Kitty gave a shriek. We chanced to be near a pair of low bars. I hadn't been a college athlete for nothing. I swung Kitty over the bars and jumped after her. But she, not knowing in her fright where she was or what she was doing, supposing also that the mad creature, like the villain in the play, would still pursue her, flung herself bodily into my arms, crying, Jack, Jack, save me. It was the first time she had called me Jack, and I needed no second invitation. I proceeded to save her, in the usual way, by holding her to my heart and kissing her lovely hair reassuringly as I murmured. You are safe, my darling, not a hair of your precious head shall be hurt. Don't be frightened. She shivered like a leaf. I am frightened, she said. I can't help being frightened. He will chase us, I know. Where is he? What is he doing now? Looking up to determine if I need abbreviate this blissful moment, I saw the enraged animal disappearing in the side door of the barn. It was a nice, comfortable Durham cow that somewhat rare but possible thing, a sportive cow. "'Is he gone?' breathed Kitty from my waistcoat. "'Yes, he is gone. She is gone, darling. But don't move. It may come again.' My first too hasty assurance had calmed Kitty's fears, and she raised her charming flushed face from its retreat and prepared to withdraw. I did not facilitate the preparations, and a moment of awkward silence ensued. Might I inquire, I asked, if the dear little person at present reposing in my arms will stay there, with intervals for rest and refreshment, for the rest of her natural life? She withdrew entirely now, all but her hand, and her eyes sought the ground. 
I suppose I shall have to. That is, if you think, at least, I suppose you do think, at any rate, you look as if you were thinking, that this has been giving you encouragement. I do indeed. Decisive, undoubted, bare-faced encouragement. I don't think I ought to be judged as if I were in my sober senses, she replied. I was frightened within an inch of my life. I told you this morning that I was dreadfully afraid of bulls, especially mad ones, and I told you that my nurse frightened me, when I was a child, with awful stories about them, and that I never outgrew my childish terror. I looked everywhere about. The barn was too far, the fence too high. I saw him coming, and there was nothing but you and the open country. Of course, I took you. It was very natural, I'm sure. Any girl would have done it. To be sure, I replied soothingly, any girl would have run after me, as you say. I didn't say any girl would have run after you. You needn't flatter yourself. And besides, I think I was really trying to protect you as well as to gain protection. Why else should I have cast myself on you like a catamount, or a catacomb, or whatever the thing is? Yes, darling, I thank you for saving my life and I am willing to devote the remainder of it to your service as a pledge of my gratitude. But if you should take up life-saving as a profession, dear, don't throw yourself on a fellow with— Jack! Jack! she cried, putting her hand over my lips, and getting it well kissed in consequence. If you will only forget that, and never, never taunt me with it afterwards, I'll— I'll— Well, I'll do anything in reason. Yes— even marry you. End of chapter 7